So my title here is uh, Geostrophic Turbulence, uh, but that's not accurate. <laughs> um, I should really have used the title of the famous paper by uh, Peter Rines, Waves and Turbulence on a Beta Plane, because I'm really going to be talking mainly about beta plane uh, turbulence and Rossby waves. So uh, what do I mean by geostrophic turbulence? Well, it's 2D turbulence with additional complications. So on one hand, the rapid rotation is good because it justifies, or partially justifies perhaps, or to some extent justifies uh, <laughs> uh, the assumption of 2D, okay? Um, but rotation introduces a bunch of other effects which are quite uh, geophysical, namely the beta effect, uh, and what's known as zonation or zonostrophic instability. And then there's other quite important complications as well which occur in geophysics, such as non-uniform layer depth due to topography, uh, stratification, baroclinicity, baroclinic instability, coupling to internal gravity waves and other unbalanced motions. All of these have been mentioned actually in passing at this meeting. Uh, the one thing, at least in this week, when I've been here, I'm going to be talking mainly about the beta effect is the additional uh, complication which goes along uh, with geostrophic turbulence. So just to remind you, um, the beta plane, the idea is to look at a restricted range of latitudes on a rapidly rotating planet where there's a local vertical which is pointing in the radial direction like that and only the uh, vertical component of the Coriolis force, of the, sorry, of the rotation vector uh, is important, but if you work out the vertical component, uh, it's not going to be uh, constant if I move through some range of latitudes delta theta, and so the simplest approximation you can make, uh, which I guess goes back to Rossby, is to expand uh, sine theta around the central latitude that you're interested in and um, write, it's horrible notation. I really think Rossby made a mistake. It's F naught plus beta Y. Why couldn't he have written F naught plus F one Y? Then we'd have the F one plane. But we're stuck, with <laughs> we're stuck with the beta plane and we're using Rossby's notation. So then there's what you might call the standard barotropic model, which is a single layer of fluid uh, potential vorticity equal to the relative vorticity, which is the Laplacian of the stream function, and plus beta y. This is the only complication, the only difference between two-dimensional turbulence and um, uh, the beta plane, sorry, and, and, the, um, and the geophysical case. But uh, this is a very, Im very, in very intricate and surprising addition to the theory. Uh, because with non-zero beta, we have both waves and turbulence. That is, if I just look at the linearized equation and I suppress the forcing and dissipation, then I've got this uh, non-trivial linear problem to solve, okay? So before we start talking, uh, we've talked about pure turbulence, we sh should talk a little bit about pure waves. That is, the solutions of the linearized um, equation. So there's going to be a little linear interlude here where I talk about the linear Rossby wave equation for just three or four slides. Many of you have probably seen this, but I think it's worthwhile to, for those who haven't, to fully understand how complicated Rossby waves are. So when we face a linear equation like this, we look for solutions like e to the i k x plus i l y minus i sigma t. We substitute in and we immediately get the dispersion relation, which is the relation between the wave frequency and the wave number K and L. So this is the way that the uh, dispersion relation is normally written. However, if we want to think geometrically about this, we can go into the wave number plane with axes K and L, and we can rewrite that uh, dispersion relation like this, and that's the equation of a circle uh, in the wave number plane. So this is the circle in the wave number plane and all wave numbers on this circle have the same frequency sigma. Uh, 
I think there must be a typo here that this k squared should this two should not be here. So the center of the circle is at this point where uh, L is zero and k is minus beta over two sigma and I've taken sigma to be positive in this illustration which is the conventional thing. So the geometry here, first of all, the geometry is actually kind of complicated because you want the group velocity, right? So the group velocity is the gradient of frequency with respect to wave number. And of course you can calculate that by doing algebra, that is calculating d sigma dk and d sigma dl. But um, yeah, and you can get those formulas, they're pretty straightforward. But geometrically it's interesting because the group velocity is therefore orthogonal to the circle because it's the gradient of sigma. So the group velocity vector is pointing towards the center of the circle in this illustration. And if you represent the wave vector as using polar coordinates, so kappa being the length of the wave vector and alpha being the, uh, the usual angle in polar coordinates like that, then the group velocity vector is at an angle two alpha to, <laughs> to the axis. It's kind of confusing. And it's a result of doing some high school geometry. You should go away and do it. Um, you know, you'll, you'll start remembering things like if you complete this triangle like that, that angle up there is 90 degrees. Remember that from your, from your youth? You've got to use facts like that. <laughs> uh, and you can see that that's the case. Uh, and the other thing to remember about this is that the size of the group velocity is beta over kappa squared, beta divided by the wave number squared. So that's what this looks like here. Here I've, uh, I've drawn the group velocity. The, the group velocity is these red vectors. And <coughs> as you go around the circle, uh, the size of the group velocity is beta over the wave number squared. So the group velocity gets bigger and bigger as the wave uh, number, k squared plus l squared, goes to zero as you approach the origin of the wave number plane, where in theory at least the group velocity is infinite and pointing due west. So what are the implications of this in a kind of non-trivial example? I'll do it fairly quickly. Um, I have fond of it because Peter Rines used to like it when I was a graduate student. Um, and it's interesting because uh, usually we think when we have a dispersion relation, it gives you spatial information from temporal information. Y you ask the question, okay, I know the frequency. What do I now know about the wave numbers that go along with that frequency? And the answer to that question is, well, not much in the case of Rossby waves, you'd think because some waves with the same frequency are very long, you know, essentially have k equals zero, and others can be rather short, and those two different wave numbers have the same frequency. So one way of appreciating that a bit more perhaps is to force the system with a single frequency with a delta function source and ask what that Green's function looks like. So <coughs> uh, we know that the uh, solution to this equation will be proportional to e to the i sigma t, e to the minus i sigma t, because that's what we forced it with. Um, so you should look for a solution like that. Uh, but the slightly ingenious part of the solution is that if you also uh, add the term minus i beta x over two omega, then this curly g function uh, satisfies a Helmholtz equation, a rather standard equation. Uh, you see, if you just, if you didn't do that, uh, you'd have a first derivative term and it wouldn't be the sort of standard equation that you learn about in mathematical physics. So this part of the, this, what, that's why this is an inspired guess, if you like. We now get the Helmholtz equation with the delta function source. And there's a whole literature that you can turn to uh, to work out the solution. And the correct one then is the uh, second order Hankel function, J naught minus I, Y naught. Um, now, there's two things to say about this. Uh, you have to apply the radiation condition, and I'll come to that on the next slide. But the radiation condition uh, is that the group velocity has to point outwards away from the source. That's why this is H2 rather than H1, which would be J naught plus I Y naught. 
uh, you'll you'll see on the next slide. I'm going to show you how that how that works. So here's uh, a picture of the Green's function. So the way you can see that it's sensible physically, that is, that the radiation is outwards. You look up the expansion of the Hankel function in the far field, and this, uh, the second Hankel function, H2, uh, is um, in the far field, becomes e to the minus i gamma r. The uh, first Hankel function would be e to the plus i gamma r. Now, why e to the minus i gamma r? It's because this function minus minus gamma times r plus x is what you might call the phase. It's the phase function in the far field. And in particular, if you drew, um, if you drew curves of constant p, that is curves of constant p in the far field, that's the equation of a parabola. So that's this parabolic set of wave crests which are radiating away from the uh, delta function source. And now, uh, using the WKB theory, the local wave numbers in the far field are derivatives of the phase function with respect to x and y, uh, which are given by this simple formula. Gamma is that constant beta over 2 omega, and cosine theta is just the polar angle in the xy plane, the usual notation. Now, to answer Paolo's question, there's two important sanity checks that you can do once you know the far field wave numbers. See, so what this is saying is pick a point in the far field over here. Uh, there's a local wave number which is associated with that point, which is given by this formula. Okay. That's sort of, if you're making measurements here, you would say, gee, there's a Rossby wave going past me, and K and L are given by that formula where theta uh, is the polar angle between the x-axis and the source. First of all, once you, um, once you have K and L, you can verify that you satisfy the dispersion relation. That is, it's just algebra. K squared plus L squared is beta K over omega. And tan alpha is the tangent of theta on 2. That's saying that the group velocity, remember that the uh, angle that the group velocity makes with the x-axis is twice the angle of the wave vector. That's verifying that that's true. So waves radiated in the theta direction have the right, I should have said, the outward group velocity, the correct sign of the group velocity. Um, and so the different scales in this monofrequency solution are sorted by the direction of the group velocity. You see long waves to the west of the source and short waves to the east of the source. So it's like doing a Fourier transform of the dispersion relation by moving around the source. Yes? To start with, why do you add a delta function in the forcing term? Like, what, what are we trying to answer here? Well, the delta function is simply the simplest model of the source. Uh, you could say, okay, what happens if we had uh, some arbitrary function of x and y here? Uh, the important part here for the moment is that I'm, I'm exploring the system when it's forced with a single frequency. Because what I'm interested in is what information do we actually get about the structure of the solution um, when the when I force with a single frequency, I know which circle I'm on in the wave number plane, right? However, there's a whole lot of different waves uh, which might appear in the solution with very different length scales, very long waves and very short waves, all with their unique group velocities. So the main reason for assuming this part of the forcing is simply to understand how those waves, how those di different waves with different wavelengths and group velocities appear in the far field. Now, if I had some other function of x and y here, uh, if I could first solve this problem, then I could use linear superposition and the theory of delta functions and Green's functions uh, to write down the solution um, to that problem 
uh, by convolving the source with the Green's function, which I'm calculating here. So if I can solve this problem for the Green's function, I can then solve the problem in principle uh, with any source, with any spatial structure of the source. Well, that you can really beat this problem to death, which is what Haight-Vogel and Rhines did in 1983 in a nice little paper. You can, for instance, calculate the energy density uh, of the radiated field. It's just the kinetic energy of the Rossby waves. You'll notice it's it decreases like 1 over R. That's kind of what you'd expect from the 1 over R decay of energy away from a source because the perimeter is growing like R. You have to have all the energy which has been injected at the point source has to escape to infinity. That's consistent with the 1 over R. But there's a 1 plus cosine theta, which is 0 due west of the source. Okay? So there's no energy density due west of the source, where 1 plus cosine theta is 0. And on the other side, 1 plus cosine theta is equal to 2. But now when you calculate the energy flux, you multiply the group velocity by the energy density. Remember, the group velocity for um, waves at the wave number 0 is infinite, and that cancels the 0 there and gives you a completely isotropic radially outwards energy flux. Okay. Bizarre thing, really. D is it intuitive to you? Hmm. <laughs> wasn't to me. <laughs> but Peter Rhines thought it was intuitive, <laughs> and this is related to the question I just got. So I'll s without trying to defend this, here is what he says. The Green's function radiates isotropically because it contains all spatial Fourier components with equal weight. Uh, that's about as much explanation as you get. <laughs> and then he goes on to say, uh, if you had a mix of spatial components, say with a Gaussian profile rather than just a delta function, uh, strong anisotropy occurs, yeah, and most of the energy actually goes west. Uh, I'll let you think about that. <laughs> but that's the end of my linear interlude. That's probably the only thing you'll hear about linear wave theory in this four-week summer school, I would guess, maybe. Uh, and I'll go back to the nonlinear problem. Uh, yeah. Uh, could you give us a little more intuition about uh, why it propagates westwards when all the when there's less spatial scales involved? Uh, first of all, uh, I've taken the external deformation radius. You know, if you really did have a barotropic fluid uh, for the depth I with a depth equal to the depth of the ocean, there's what's called the external deformation length which is an extra term in the equation that I didn't even write. So the potential vorticity would be R del squared psi minus, say, KD, the deformation wave number squared, psi plus beta y. And what's the formula for KD squared? It's F naught squared uh, G over H. And if you work this out, y the length, which is 1 on KD, using the full G, 9.8 meters per second per second, uh, 1 over KD and H is 1,000 meters. I think this turns out to be about 4,000 kilometers, something like that. So this is a very small wave number. And the infinity that I'm seeing in the group velocity, uh, you could say, is an artifact of neglecting that term. If I kept that term, uh, the dispersion relation would not the dispersion circle would no longer go through the origin. It'd still be a dispersion circle, but it would not go through the origin. Um, the deformation wave number would stop that happening. The group velocity would no longer be infinite. That singularity would, would disappear. Does that make you feel a little bit better about it or I'm being asked whether the uh, three-dimensionality has anything to do with this. No, it's a purely two-dimensional effect. Um, when you add the deformation 
uh, length here, you could say that's a three-dimensional effect because it corresponds to very small displacements of the sea surface, so the depth is four kilometers. And uh, I'm making what's called, when I neglect this term, I'm making what's called the rigid lid approximation, which is neglecting that displacement of the sea surface um, so that I just get the equation I started with. Now, let's talk about waves and turbulence. The simplest problem perhaps you can do is use, don't consider any forcing. Uh, you make the dissipation as small as you possibly can, the smallest you can afford numerically. Uh, you just start an initial value problem. You make up an initial condition. Uh, here's one, and um, this is the case beta equals zero, which I discussed in my first lecture. What you see is that you can start with a random initial condition, which rapidly self-organizes into uh, vortices, which then evolve by merger of like sign vortices. This is the vortex gas solution, and that's what we saw in lecture one. So the big, uh, one of the first simple messages is that beta destroys all of that phenomenology with beta not equal to zero. Uh, instead of vortices, if we start off with a random initial condition and non-zero beta, then you see the formation of uh, zonal bands. Uh, and I'll show a movie which, uh, when we turn to forcing, I'll show a movie which shows how this happens, okay? So you don't form vortices anymore. Uh, what you get are actually east-west jets flowing alternately, uh, alternately eastward and westward. Um, and that's what I'll call zonation. And um, the man himself <laughs> from, uh, let's see, must have been around 1980 in Woods Hole. Um, so th one of the main questions is then you form, uh, from the solution of the initial value problem, uh, you form these zonal jets and what is the wavelength of the zonal jets? Now, <coughs> the answer is the Rhine's length, the square root of u over beta, but now what's u? So the point is, um, energy is still robustly conserved when we add beta. So I've got the equation here. Here's the beta enhanced equation. And I can do exactly what I did in lecture number one. I can work out the energy conservation law. I multiply the equation by psi. I'm in a doubly periodic domain, for instance, so I integrate and all the boundary conditions disappear. The beta term makes no difference to this argument. So I get exactly the same energy equation that I got back in lecture one. And then I go to the entropy. Uh, I multiply the equation by zeta and I integrate over the domain and the beta term still disappears. Okay. So this goes, so I get exactly the same equations. And now I say, okay, this means that the entropy is bounded by its initial value because it's always decreasing and never gets any bigger than it was at t equals zero. And that means that the dissipation of energy uh, goes to zero with nu. Okay? So the energy is robustly conserved with or without beta. So then I can define a u like that, and that's the Rhine's length, and that's the emergent scale of the jet spacing. It works pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when I say it's the emergent scale, what I mean is that there's some non-dimensional number in front of this, and we're not going to waste any time arguing about whether it's two, because it actually does change depending on the situation. Yes. So it's a, it's a scaling result. You should define a jet scale um, and, uh, you know, just plot L jet over L Rhines and measure that constant in different situations. So do you have an explanation for this, or is it just an empirical result? Or? Well, the explanation is, what else could it be? Dimensionally, <laughs> uh, it's kind of irritating, <laughs> but I'll talk a little bit about it in me mechanistic details. But at this level, there's two. the whole system is characterized by two parameters, which can be uh, taken as beta and u. And so on dimensional grounds, this is the only way of making a length. Okay. Um, I should say that uh, what prevented us doing things like this in the other case, the case with um, beta equals zero, uh, 
was that uh, there was another conserved quantity, which was Zeta X, the vorticity extrema. So it seems that with the beta effect, you no longer have that second invariant. So you've really only got one invariant, which is the energy. And therefore, you've only got one dimensional parameter, which is the energy. And that, therefore, compels so that result. So y you have another scale, which is the, the domains. So oh yes, you I should. You could, you could build any scale you wish using yeah. this tool. Yeah. Uh, so I should just say yes. You're absolutely right, Freddie. Um, in fact, that's what happens. How do we ever recover the beta equals zero case? Then you should ask. So I think what you're saying is I'm very definitely assuming that the Rhine scale is much less than the domain scale. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. So you can see what happens if I try to recover um, the results from lecture one by decreasing beta. I mean, it must happen, right? If I just take the same initial condition and make beta smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually I have to get to the vortex gas solution from equation one. Well, the way that happens, holding you fixed, if I reduce beta, the Rhine scale just gets bigger and bigger until you can't fit any more jets in the domain. And then that's how you recover the other case the beta equals zero case. So do you see homogenization of potential vorticity in the jets? Uh, no, the jets are definitely not well mixed. I'll talk about the hom homogenization of PV. It may happen in the force problem, but not in the initial value problem. So what happens in the case where in the initial condition there is a much more anstrophy at small scale than the one provided by uh, the beta plane, then do you can take the, you have another length scale given by the ratio of anthropy to energy. Uh, yeah. So um, there is, there's definitely an entropy cascade and I think there is an analog, people argue about this and it's, I think it's a frontier research question, but the analog of the zeroth law of turbulence for 2D turbulence is whether the entropy dissipation rate approaches a constant independent of nu as nu goes to zero. So the, a the answer to the question is if I try to make another length scale uh, based on the entropy, which I could, it's the entropy is not a robustly conserved um, invariant. That is, the tiniest little bit of nu will result in uh, a lot of destruction of entropy. And so that's not uh, a parameter that's useful to scale the solution. So there's another reliable uh, bit of mumbo jumbo uh, turbulence phenomenology, which is the um, Vallis and Maltru dumbbell, which goes back to a paper that um, Vallis and Maltru wrote when I must have been the middle mid 80s maybe. I might just forget the date. 93. Oh, okay, more recent than I thought. So um, this is the initial value problem that I was talking about at the moment. You start off at t equals zero uh, with all of the energy on this annulus in the wave number space. And the nonlinear uh, transfers start to take over. And at later times, you form this pattern that they call the dumbbell. Right? You see it's this, there's this excluded region here. And everything is accumulating along the uh, ky axis. And the um, explanation for this is the following. There's two time scales in the wave turbulence problem. One is given to us by the Rossby wave dispersion relation. And the other is given to us by simply Doppler shifting. You've got a speed u, which you should think of as some sort of isotropic advection. And uh, the time scale uh, that you get from Doppler shifting would be u times the wave number squared. So now I go into my favorite polar coordinate system and I've got a funny looking curve defined by the condition that the radius, uh, the radial distance in the wave number space uh, is proportional to the square root of mod cod al cos alpha, where cos alpha, you know, is the angle um, like that. And if you plot that curve, you then triumphantly compare the shape of curves like that with what you see from the simulations. This is the dumbbell, okay? Um, 
So reading from uh, Vallis and Meltrude's paper, within the dumbbell, that is in here, uh, characteristic Rossby wave times are shorter than the turbulent turnover times. In other words, um, this Rossby wave frequency is very high. It's much faster than the, t the eddy turnover time inside the dumbbell. This inhibits en transfer of energy from the turbulent regime because efficient forcing of a wave-like mode will be achieved only when the forcing frequency is comparable to the natural frequency. I don't fully understand it, but it seems to at least qualitatively capture what we see when we look at the evolution of the um, initial energy spectrum. Yeah. Just a terminology thing. So what do you mean by eddy turnover time? Ah, well, we have a characteristic velocity because we're conserving energy. Um, so at the level of this argument, um, well actually this is an eddy turnover frequency because it has dimensions one on time. So, um, so this is advection. This is the f this is the inverse time scale you'd get by uh, advecting a wave with wave number equal to that uh, through its own length. Okay. No, uh, uh, the question was: This only makes sense when you have a mean flow. Uh, not necessarily. The um, the reason. Um, that this is isotropic advection is because Vallis and Maltrude are thinking of U as being some sort of isotropic turbulent velocity, um, which is advecting waves in all sorts of different directions, and they're simply equating that advection time scale uh, to the time scale of waves. Okay. So they call it a dumbbell, but I would prefer to call it actually myself a funnel, because what it's saying is that as energy moves towards the origin of the wave number plane, that's the inverse cascade of energy. Uh, it's directed into this funnel along the kx equals zero axis. It's funneled in uh, to that, and that's the formation of the zonal bands, or things with long, long x scales. So th this is a, a, a transient feature, right? It uh, it, hap it happens only during the first stage of uh, organization towards jets. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think you always see pictures like this, at least. I don't think the dumbbell goes away at long time. Uh, the evolution of the system certainly becomes slower. And uh, I don't know what fraction of the energy ends up in the jets. It's a substantial fraction. Yeah, oh yeah, it's a robust feature. Yeah. Um, one thing I'd like to understand better, but I can't give you any information on, is does the fraction of energy in the zonal flow keep increasing, or does it equilibrate at roughly, say, half the energy is in the zonal mean flow, and the other half is in eddies? I don't know. I don't, it hasn't been a... I think people got um, less interested in the initial value problem and moved on to the force dissipative problem, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about next. But I think there's probably still a few loose ends. Yeah. Is is it similar to is it ca kind of a spontaneous generation problem, but for Rossby waves rather than internal waves, or is that the wrong way to think about it? It's certainly a spontaneous generation of zonal flows, which we'll see, I think, spectacularly in the force problem. Um, yeah, so if, uh, uh, there'd be no surprise that you get lots of Rossby waves when you start off with some jumble, right? They're there in the initial condition. At t equals zero, you put them in with your random number generator. So of course you get a, a wave-like response. Uh, what is surprising is that the combination of the linear dispersion relation and the nonlinearity uh, results in this pattern. I'd prefer to call it a funnel, and the creation of zonal flows. I've been asked what happens when u is approaching zero. I think that's the uh, limit where the Rhine's the square root of u over beta. So you'd be making the Rhine's um, length even smaller. Um, and that's the, sp that's the case where it's a long way away from two-dimensional turbulence. You'll get many jets with uh, small scale. Um, yeah. I see you look puzzled. I don't think I've answered your question uh, correctly or satisfactorily. <laughs> 
Can I ask how, how does the picture change depending on the initial condition, the amplitude of the initial condition? Well, the, um, so that's like changing you. So if you believe the argument that the only um, uh, velocity scale in town is you, you'd be making your um, annulus bigger and the answer would be uh, it wouldn't change at all. It would simply be that everything is proportional to the Rhine scale provided you continue to respect that constraint that the Rhine's length is much less than the domain scale and so you'd see exactly the same thing, I think. I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is the connection with weak turbulence, how, how we would... Because when we weak turbulence works in the, in the limit, if it works, in the limit of small amplitude or the initial condition. I defer this to Alan, but I'd say you'd have to make, you have to be sure that U was less than the the uh, frequency of all waves in the system, maybe, or most of the waves in the system, and that's kind of difficult to do because there's a waves with very low frequencies, namely zonal flows, which have zero frequency. Do you know what happens if you uh, put all the energy initially in the uh, dumbbell? Oh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, no, I don't. <laughs> Uh, if you go to the tutorial this afternoon on how to write your own uh, pseudo-spectral code, I suggest you do that as the first. <laughs> the, the initial value problem is clearly not solved, um, as far as I can tell. <laughs> okay, another question. No, I've been asked, I don't know where the dumbbell is at the start of the problem. Uh, that's not true, because I do know you. I specify the energy when I give my initial condition, and u is simply the square root of the energy. Right, that's the one property of the initial condition I'm saying. Let me go back to that, because this is like the fundamental thing about the initial value problem. The energy is conserved, robustly conserved. What do I mean by robustly conserved? I mean that the presence of the viscosity uh, does not result in dissipa significant dissipation of energy. So once I... Uh, once I assign the energy at t equals zero with my random number generator, um, then that velocity scale is with us forever. Everything else, like the entropy, is dissipated by the transfer to high wave numbers and the amplification of vorticity gradients. So you're stuck with the Rhine scale and beta. And I am assuming, however, that it's a big domain in that, in that sense. Now I'm going to move to an even more difficult problem since we've so satisfactorily solved the initial value problem, which is the forced, um, forced beta plane turbulence. <coughs> and very imp so I'm going to use a Z. This red Z is my forcing function, which I'll come to in a second. Um, yeah, and here's the papers by Vallis and Maltrude in which a lot of this was worked out. Um, I'm also adding uh, Ekman drag for reasons which will become clear in a second. So this is Ekman friction. There's a physically well-justified mechanism behind it, which is the um, physics of Ekman boundary layers at the bottom of the domain. Uh, and the forcing at Z, it models, well, what is it? It models uh, some unspecified smaller scale process such as baroclinic eddies. If you went to the tutorial yesterday, I showed you some two-layer simulations in which there was baroclinic instability. Uh, you could think of zeta here as the barotropic mode of that two-layer system. And then if you're thinking of it as the barotropic mode of the two-layer system, you have to have some representation of the baroclinic instability, which would be the red Xe. Uh, um, Popular but not universal assumption is that the forcing is characterized by its injection rate, the rate at which it does work, uh, and nothing else is important. Okay. For example, the length scale of the forcing is irrelevant, provided that it's small enough. And I'll critique that assumption as we go along. Well, small enough, it would be much smaller than the jet uh, uh, yeah. spacing. Yes, that's right. So in other words, there'd be another inequality here. Let's call it L sub Xe, some link scale which characterizes the forcing Xe. Uh, 
So uh, the most popular model actually in the field, maybe Ted talked about it last week, um, is comes from this, well, I'm not saying Lilly was the first guy to do it uh, in this field, but this paper I think has been unjustly neglected. Um, Doug Lilly first proposed, I think it was Lilly, uh, that, we sh that it was interesting to consider white noise forcing. And the simplest version of white noise forcing, uh, this is what it looks like. <laughs> it's homogeneous, isotropic, uh, spectrally narrow band. That means that I use a bunch of wave numbers which all lie on a fairly tight annulus in wave number space, the circle circular annulus in wave number space. So there's a well-defined forcing wave number, K sub F, which is one over, you know, actually I used, ex let me call it L sub F for forcing rather than XZ, so then it'll be consistent with my later slides. Right, <laughs> what I can do in fact, I'm not even going to discuss the numerical procedure for generating it. Uh, what I'm doing you is showing you that at every time step, literally at, oops, literally at every time step, I pick a different spatial pattern. Yeah. And so what you're seeing is individual time steps here. And I'm going to try and make it as small scale as I can get away with. In this example, the domain is 2 pi L by 2 pi L. So there's like 32 wavelengths of the white noise forcing in the domain. Yeah. Did Ted talk about this last week? Uh, I'm not sure. Sorry? No, okay, good. No, uh, there's a, a procedure then by white noise. Uh, as you reduce the time step, you have to increase the amplitude of the forcing by one over the square root of the time step. That's a simple recipe for ensuring that there's, that it actually is white noise. I'm not going to talk about the stochastic forcing. Um, that's something which is best discussed, I think, outside the lecture. Uh, just to make sure that um, we're on the same page with zonal averaging. It's been mentioned already, but I think it wouldn't hurt to be specific about it. The zonal average of anything, you simply integrate all the way across the domain and divide by the length of the domain. Um, X derivatives have zero zonal average because everything is periodic. So if I zonally average an X derivative like V, I'm going to get zero. What I mean by the zonal mean flow is the zonal average of U, and we can do a Reynolds decomposition, U bar plus U prime. Often there'll be an additional, uh, actually I, I won't do this, but sometimes it is convenient to include an additional time average in the definition of the bar to remove any turbulent pulsations which are left after you do the zonal average. Let's first do a problem where we don't take the, um, this is a historically, I think, a very important problem, where we take Lilly's forcing function uh, and multiply it by a window, which is 0 and 1. So we're forcing only in a narrow strip in the middle of the domain. Okay. This was first done in the lab by Jack Whitehead. And these are all the authors who are associated with this problem. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s. So you've seen here the zonal flow, U bar, which goes along with this uh, problem. And what you will see is the slow but inexorable creation of a zonal mean flow. And it's kind of interesting, right? You've got a westward, sorry, an eastward flow in the force strip and then a westward flow out here on the flanks away from the, force, away from the forcing region. And of course, um, if you look back at the equations of motion, it's not too hard to show that you have to conserve momentum. That's certainly a relief. That is, the forcing is not putting in net momentum. So the total amount of momentum in the fluid started at zero. It should remain at zero. And that's the case. If I integrate this velocity from minus infinity to infinity, I get zero. That's because there is as much fluid going uh, west as east in this solution. Yeah. So what did we just see? And this is, I think, the um, 
I think this is one of the leading explanations for the formation of the jet stream. Am I being too, am I exaggerating? Ted did, oh, Ted did, okay. Yeah, so I thought he would have because meteorologists love it. <laughs> Oceanographers like it too. So you've got um, the localized wave generation in the strip and you've got group propagation northwards above the strip and southwards below the strip. You look at the pattern of Rossby waves that go along with those sign of the group velocities, with, with that particular sign of the group velocity, and you see that um, that means there's a positive UV correlation uh, to the south of the forced region and a negative correlation to the north of the forced region. So that's transferring momentum. That's a Reynolds non-zero Reynolds stress. It's just a property of the Rossby wave dispersion relation, if you like. And that's producing this pattern of acceleration, easy to understand pattern of acceleration perhaps, that is westward flow, excuse me, eastward flow in the forced region. So uh, are you actually in a linear regime such that this explanation with Rossby wave uh, is relevant? Uh, you're probably not in the linear regime, perhaps in the middle of the strip, but out here where the, uh, I think it probably is relevant. Um, it's rather inhomogeneous flow because it's forced here and there's no forcing out there. Certainly as you move away from the forced region, you'd expect that the linear wave theory is working pretty well. Yeah. Then the flanks are where you're pulling momentum from? Huh. Well, momentum is unmixing. I am conserving the momentum. Um, so uh, <laughs> pulling momentum, I don't know. Uh, if it, I'm accelerating it uh, eastward here, to conserve momentum, it has to be going westward somewhere else. Um, and what I'm saying is from the Rossby wave propagation, you can understand the uh, westward acceleration, sorry, the eastward acceleration in the forced region. Uh, I th I, uh, let me rephrase your remark. You're saying there's no reason that it couldn't be uniform, n uniformly negative. You mean the mean flow being uniformly negative? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, that's in fact, yes. Uh, so the other ingredient that goes along with this is there is some drag out here. I'm keeping new. So the Rossby waves uh, decay very slowly because of the drag, and that produces um, these flanks which uh, which don't extend forever. Now, if I consider the problem with nu equals zero, uh, I think, well, I'm not sure exactly what happens. I suppose in the idealized case, this would keep accelerating forever because there's no drag. And the uh, to conserve momentum, you'd uh, produce uh, a larger and larger region of uh, westward flow outside the forced region. Yeah, so nu is, the so drag is definitely doing something in this uh, situation. Yeah. So, so as you just pointed out, uh, dissipation is important in this procedure because uh, Rossby waves have to go away and dissipate further away from the middle of the of the domain so that they transport eastward momentum to the middle of the region. This is what Ted was saying also. Yeah. And I asked him, so what happens uh, when we forced everywhere? So th the Rossby waves cannot go elsewhere and get dissipated. He avoided answering, and perhaps he referred <laughs> it to you. I, I will try and answer that question. Uh, um, I, I will come to, in fact. What happens with this narrative that Rossby waves radiate into the unforced region and dissipate? Um, it all goes to hell in a handbasket is the short answer to your question, and we'll see that too. Um, so in, in this uh, picture, um, if we look at the, the zonal average, is there a way to, um, to uh, fit the, um, the, wave the effect of wave propagation with the turbulent uh, diffusivity or something like that? I'll also come to the question of whether turbulent diffusivities are a useful way to think about this. I, I don't think so, is the answer. And well, maybe, but not really. <laughs> 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 
uh, what we can do, and this is done by several people, Peter Rines, McEwen and Plum, everybody had a go at this, I think. Um, what you can do is assume the forcing is weak and just do an expansion in the strength of the forcing. Um, and then, you know, at leading order, we get the linear equation. Uh, so this, remember, is that strip, that forcing strip. People weren't thinking about stochastic forcing when they did this. You know, you'd pick a Gaussian profile, and so the forcing would be Z is a Gaussian in Y times cos Kx minus Ct, something deterministic like that. And then you'd solve this equation. It can be done. And then you'd calculate the Reynolds stress from that solution. And then this would be the mean flow equation. I should have written down what you get for the mean flow equation since it's so important. It's on another slide, but here's the equation we're talking about. Oh. Plus mu zeta is xz. Now, if I zonally average, a whole lot of terms disappear. I kill anything with an x derivative. And I kill the forcing because it has no zonal average. And um, zeta bar is uh, Vx minus Uy, and that term is 0. So zeta bar is minus Uyt. So that's what this term becomes after zonal averaging. And there's a little bit of work to do here. But it turns out this term is also a y derivative after zonal averaging. And so as a result, we can then integrate in y. And we get d by dt of u bar um, plus mu u bar is, I guess I'll write them on the other side, is something which is completely unsurprising, is that u bar is forced by the divergence of Reynolds stresses. Okay, so that's going from there to there simply by zonal averaging. Okay. Um, so that's what I'm saying here. If you can solve the leading order problem, you can then calculate the Reynolds stresses, assume that the zonal mean flow is steady, and that's your prediction of u bar. It's a very detailed and straightforward way of calculating the zonal mean flow. But uh, you, you assume that the zonal flow is small enough. Yeah, that's so right. It's, it's the yeah. again for the initial stage. Of well, it's a restriction on the size of the forcing. Yeah. But it's, you know, the first thing you do if you were thinking about this problem, yeah. I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of um, trickery with entropy. Because actually, I think it makes contact with a lot of the things we were talking about in Raffaelli's lecture. Um, and I just want to show you that the tricks that Raff Raffaelli was showing you about the Osborne-Cox relation and all of that, they're all more than tricks. They're tricks that work more than once, and so therefore they count as techniques. Uh, if we form the equation for the eddy PV by subtracting the zonal, the zonally averaged, uh, equation from the um, the full equation, we get an equation for zeta prime. There it is, right? Now, we don't try to solve it. Instead, we multiply it by zeta prime, and then we zonally average. Okay, This is the eddy entropy equation. The reason we do that, I say recall Taylor's identity, but I haven't actually shown you Taylor's <laughs> identity. <laughs> So let me talk about Taylor's identity before I proceed. The average of the Jacobian here is the average of u zeta x plus v zeta y, zonal average. This term is 0 because it's a, um, an x derivative. This term, v zeta bar, is v vx average, which is going to be 0, minus um, v uy averaged. So that term is 0 
and then this is minus d by dy of u v averaged. I've got to then add on uh, u v y. But v y is minus u x, so that term is zero because it's an x average. So the so the p v flux, the eddy p v flux is minus the divergence of the Reynolds stresses. This is Taylor's identity. It should really be at the center in big print of some slide. Yeah, because this is equal to minus u ux because um, ux plus vy is zero and so yeah, okay it's pretty important it shouldn't be down here at the corner it should be front and center somewhere um, now <coughs> so when I form the eddy entropy equation it's another way of getting the PV flux, which is through Taylor's identity, is giving us another handle on the Reynolds stress divergence. Now, so this is an exact result, and now we make some of the same approximations, or in fact exactly the same approximations, that we were talking about in yesterday's lecture, whereas I argue that if things are weak, uh, weak nonlinearity, sufficient scale separation, um, beta is much bigger than UYY, that is the jets aren't too strong, then I can neglect a whole bunch of terms and what's important is uh, the production I is, this is actually the production of eddy entropy, that V prime, zeta prime correlation. So whatever we do, we can't ignore the production of entropy. That's the So this gives me, um, uh, and this of course is the destruction of eddy entropy by the two different dissipative mechanism, me different dissipative mechanisms, namely bottom drag and lateral friction. So if I go back to the mean flow equation, I, c I have another expression for v prime zeta prime, uh, because that was what was generating u bar. I can use that alternative expression to write the zonal mean flow like this. It's the difference between entropy production by the forcing, entropy dissipation um, by the dissipation divided by mu beta. Okay. So for, for instance, in the unforced regions, when you're outside the forced strip, xz is zero and u bar is guaranteed to be negative. That's westward flow. Westward flow in the unforced regions is a robust prediction of this result because in the unforced regions, xz is zero. All you've got is dissipation of eddy entropy, um, and that's why the solution is negative. The flow is negative. Yeah. I'm being asked to repeat that and slow down. Um, <laughs> so what I'm saying is, uh, are you happy at this point? Um, so if I look at this, I'm seeing that u bar is the difference between two quantities. Uh, one is the production of eddy entropy by the random forcing, and there are these two negative definite terms which are dissipation. So if I'm in the unforced region, xz is zero, this term which might be positive is zero, and therefore uh, u bar is negative. <coughs> 
that's westward flow in the unforced regions. Okay, this is true everywhere, of course. So when we see eastward flow, uh, what it must mean uh, is that this term uh, is sufficiently positive that we can get eastward flow. It's also interesting that when mu goes to zero, this goes to non-zero non value. Yeah. Uh, some of the assumptions I made to get here probably, like for instance, weak nonlinearity, may also go out the window when if you make mu too small. For instance, uh, we know I think that as you reduce mu to zero, the jets just keep accelerating indefinitely, get faster and faster, and maybe it's not true. It's not correct to neglect UYY relative to beta. And once again, I'll discuss the strongly nonlinear case uh, separately, uh, but I think it's important to appreciate what you can do in the weakly nonlinear regime. Another question. Uh, what do you exactly mean by weak nonlinearity non assumption? I mean that I can go from here to here. <laughs> but in physical... <laughs> well, okay, here's a cubic we term, right? This is proportional to the cube of the, um, the third power of the eddies because it's got three eddy terms in it. So by weak nonlinearity, I mean that third powers are smaller than second powers. This term would actually be zero if I included a time average in my uh, definition of the bar. So that term is gone with time averaging. Um, in the weakly nonlinear case, u bar counts as a quantity which is second order in the uh, in the energy, sorry, in the eddy parameter, right? That's a second order term, so it's definitely less than the zero order term beta. Um, this is a second order term which I'm also neglecting. Um, here it's a little less clear, but it's the same assumption that Raffaelli was making, which is that it's a y derivative. So, well, we, should, we might want to keep this. I don't know. I, th I suspect it's pretty small. Yeah. Here I'm hand-waving. Uh, I think this is the one that probably would require some checking in the weekly nonlinear limit. I think, well, I don't know. I won't speculate. I was undecided whether I'd open this can of worms. But I've already been asked about whether it's useful to think of I diffusivities. Oh, yeah. I have a question on the previous slide. Okay. So if we tra take uh, the expression of for u bar and we consider beta, so the, the final expression, yeah. beta goes to zero, then it blows up. So yes. we have that that's also what we get. Yeah, uh, it's also what you get if you set mu to zero. And okay. my response is the same. Uh, these are both limits in which, um, in which the weak nonlinearity assumption is, is probably not supportable. Uh, we know, for instance, that, well, let's go to your beta. All the link scales in the problem will get bigger if I make beta go to zero. So the whole thing will become comparable to the domain scale. You'll see domain size effects. It's a very different limit. Is there another question? No. Okay. It's interesting, there was a, a debate of. Um, Actually, it's not sure it was a debate of whether they were just ignoring each other. But <laughs> between two of the giants of 20th century fluid mechanics, Prandtl and Taylor, and it was all about the fact, or the question, about whether you, it was correct to mix vorticity with a Taylor diffusivity, a Taylor eddy diffusivity, um, or, at, actually I've got it backwards, Taylor should be over here, or following Prandtl, uh, an eddy viscosity, in which the Reynolds stress uh, was proportional to u bar y. And keep in mind that these guys, u prime v prime and v prime zeta prime, are intimately connected by Taylor's identity. <laughs> okay. And here, kappa and nu aren't necessarily constants. Uh, they're not definitely not constants. They would have to be worked out and adjusted. But is it a useful concept? So let's take a look at Taylor's suggestion. Taylor wasn't thinking about beta plane problems, and that's good because on the beta plane it all goes horribly wrong, I'd claim. Um, in the weakly nonlinear case, q bar y is essentially beta, uh, 
and therefore the vorticity flux according to Taylor's closure would be the Taylor diffusivity uh, times beta. Yeah. But then uh, the zonal momentum equation, I forgot to put in the uh, minus mu u bar, which is kind of an oversight, uh, has a problem. In fact, uh, does it have a problem? Yeah, it does have a problem. I should have written here uh, mu u bar. Um, the prediction would be that u bar is kappa Taylor times beta over mu, but to conserve momentum, the integral of u has to be zero, which would imply that any model for the Taylor diffusivity you could pick uh, would have to have that structure that the integral of the Taylor diffusivity with respect to y uh, would be zero. Otherwise, it would not be conserving momentum on the beta plane. In other words, uh, beta times kappa Taylor uh, is the net source of zonal momentum with this closure. And that source, we know, uh, has to have both signs because there's not actually a source of net momentum. We're simply mixing momentum. So the Taylor PV diffusi diffusivity uh, cannot be positive definite, and that's not good because we normally think of diffusivities as being positive definite. Uh, the prandtl eddy viscosity does not have this issue because um, instead of this structure, you would have dBdy y of the Prandtl closure, uh, and momentum conservation is guaranteed when you integrate over y because it's dBdy y of something. In other words, it's hard to reconcile these two different proposals for a closure uh, with the Taylor identity, which says that these guys are connected, and Taylor identity and also the presence of beta. So that's why I think it's just confusing maybe to think about diffusivities of either, or certainly PV diffusivity is pretty confusing here. Now Naveed was complaining that Ted was uh, avoiding the uh, issue of what happens if you um, force homogeneously. I'm going to sneak up on that problem by uh, making my force strip wider And here it is, I haven't shown you the spin-up, but here's what happens if you simply increase the width of the force strip doing nothing else. So, well, it's shocking, isn't it? <laughs> Instead of one eastward jet, uh, we get two. And at this point, the narrative uh, starts to become difficult to interpret, I'd say. We get a small region of westward flow in the center of this uh, broadly, broadly forced region. And um, this is a, an open question, you know, it would be given the um, importance of the narrow strip forcing as a conceptual model for the formation of the jet stream. Um, there's obviously some bifurcation which occurs as we simply keep every parameter in the problem fixed uh, and just increase the width of the strip. Okay. When do you go from one jet to two as you change that parameter, the width of the strip? That's an open question, yeah. Let's avoid it and do an even, since we can't answer that one, we'll do an even more difficult one, which is where, <laughs> where we make the strip infinitely broad. This is simply spatially homogeneous forcing. Beta plane, once again, white noise. I'm going to switch on the movie. This will be the zonal mean flow. You'll see we'll form jets, and at the end, there's going to be seven jets in the domain. The white curve uh, shows, I think, um, UYY on a cut down the center with no averaging. It's just UYY. You'll see it forms a certain, a certain uh, sawtooth um, structure which suggests cancellation with beta, which is what's happening because the total PV gradient is uh, beta minus UYY. And in this part of the UY, in this region, UYY is roughly constant and cancels some fraction of beta. So uh, at the end, you see we have formed this pretty regular uh, set of jets. There are seven of them. 
and they've got a fairly well-defined spacing. And characteristically, uh, the point, there are pointy westward flows and broader uh, eastward flows. There's an, there's an east-west asymmetry in the structure of the jets. Later on, we're going to introduce a number called the xenostrophy number, which is a non-dimensional parameter. It's the energy supply by the forcing multiplied by beta squared divided by the fifth power of mu, and in this solution, it's 10 to the 6, which turns out to not be very large in terms of regime changes. So this is a question. Can this be seen as equivalent of the decay problem when forcing is uniform and sta uh, reaches stationary? Um, it's certainly very similar to what we see in the decay problem. Uh, first of all, I don't want to call it the decay problem because energy is not decaying. Uh, Sorry, initial <laughs> value problem. The initial value problem. Yes, it is. Ver I hate to be so pedantic, but I think it's important. Um, I think it's very similar to what you see in the... Um, initial value problem, and uh, the length scale here uh, is consistent uh, with the Rhine scaling, yeah. This was a movie that was made by my student, Koshik Srinivasan, but I think many other authors have studied this problem. So I, you know, what do you call the Rhine scale in that case? So you, you, I mean, you, you can work a scale from epsilon. Yeah. And uh, so, so it, it may be different from the. I'll, I'll, I'll carefully define the Rhine scale for the force problem on my next transparency, I think. But now let's just think what we saw. What I think we saw <laughs> is there's actually an underlying spatially homogeneous turbulent flow. That is, um, there is a solution to the equations of motion in which you don't form jets, everything is just spatially homogeneous. But that f uh, turbulent flow is, un is actually unstable. The turbulence is unstable to jet formation. Initially, the jets grow exponentially, and then they saturate at finite amplitude. Once they are saturated, uh, they're pretty strong, and the turbulence is no longer homogeneous because the jets are shearing the turbulence. That's part of the saturation mechanism. So that's what I would like to call zonostrophic instability. You can also view it as negative viscosity or anti-friction, as you prefer. But the reason I'm thinking of it as an instability is uh, there's no position Y which is special or, deter or in this solution. The fact that a jet forms at one place rather than the other is simply an accident of the, of the random number generator that you've used to create the forcing. Okay? So it's a symmetry-breaking instability. It's breaking the homogeneity in the y direction. So it's, it's an instability at the initial stage uh, again. Afterwards, it's uh, yeah. The, uh, it's the, it's the initial it's formation. It's a self-sustaining, uh, statistically stationary structure. Again yes. Afterwards. Yes, it's an instability of the initial um, homogeneous so structure right. state. So then, when you run it very long time. You see that the position of these jets and even the number of them change o over an extremely long time scale. Uh, well, maybe we haven't run long enough, but we haven't seen much indication of that. They seem to appear and stay where they are. They don't. We can make them migrate with so various so tricks. So, for instance, uh, during the first week, I mean, we have seen uh, lo lo Laura. Uh, Laura gave a very short uh, four minutes talk where we see this. Uh, so other people like Eric or have seen this over a very long time scale. Too. Yeah. Yeah, we can make them move with tricks. Like, for instance, bottom topography. If you have a. I'm not sure how you make yours migrate bottom topography. Okay. Um, I can make them migrate if I pick a forcing which breaks mirror symmetry. Maybe. Is that what you're doing? Okay, I'll have to talk to you later. Um, all I can say is in it's, it's, it occurs on time scale which are thousands or billions of turnover times of a system. It's a very weak stochastic evolution. Okay, maybe I just haven't integrated long enough. Uh, the integration here was um, over four or five uh, drag time scales. 
I non-dimensionalize with the drag coefficient. Um, also, it's, it is true that you can get uh, vacillation where the number of jets, it can't decide whether to form six or seven and you get jet splitting and reformation. We've certainly seen that happening. I, I've, uh, I can't answer the question about whether they're going to migrate or not on exceedingly long time scales. In the Y direction. One thing that it's also true is that the fraction of energy which goes into the zonal mean flow, in this solution it's only a third of the energy maybe is in the zonal mean flow, but as you decrease the bottom drag, uh, the jets get stronger of course, and they have an increasingly large fraction of the zonal, of the total energy. This is a slide which should have appeared previously, I mean, a bunch earlier in the presentation. Um, I'm just, re so let me recap. Here's the, um, here's what I get if I zonally average the, z the, the PV equation. I can integrate in Y and come back to the momentum equation. I have Taylor's diffusivity, which says that this term becomes something which is very familiar, namely the, um, divergence of the Reynolds stresses. And so the one new thing that I've added here is in the situation we were looking at in the movie, uh, the lateral viscosity is weak. I'm going to neglect it. I'm going to either neglect the time dependence of the jets or put in a time average. So that term is zero. And then if you look at the mean energy equation, which you'd get by multiplying by U bar, uh, you can see that uh, you can see the anti-frictional effect that the Reynolds stresses have the wrong sign to be consistent with um, a positive eddy viscosity. So once again, I'm um, just not uh, convinced that using eddy viscosities for momentum or um, Taylor diffusivities for potential vorticity uh, is at all useful. Um, there's one other thing. Okay, here I'm going to talk about the Ryan scale uh, in the force problem, as I promised to do. So, forcing and drag, we can form the energy power integral, we multiply by minus psi, we integrate over the domain, we get the rate of work of the force, which can be written like that, and we get the energy dissipation, which is mostly due to the drag. <coughs> yes, there's a little bit of viscous dissipation, but it's in light green, so you can't see it very well because it's very small. So there's a two-term two balance between injection of, injection of energy by the forcing and the bottom drag, which is the main sink of energy. I'd say the only sink of energy, really, if you could do it as well as we would like to. Now, that means that if we know epsilon, the injection rate, the forcing rate, then we know the RMS velocity because I simply take this equation uh, and solve it for the RMS velocity. It's the square root of epsilon over mu. And so that would be a known parameter because one other property of white noise forcing, uh, which I haven't talked about, is that the energy injection rate is actually an external parameter. When you write your computer program uh, to put it to code white noise forcing, this is one of the uh, parameters that you can set at will. It's your choice. It's completely controlled. So that's one of the reasons I think that for theoreticians, white noise forcing has been such a popular choice. It gives them an excuse to think of epsilon as a known quantity. Whereas, of course, in any problem that we really care about, for instance, baroclinic instability, uh, epsilon is the main unknown that we're interested in determining. And uh, drag is required to achieve a statistical steady state. That's the other obvious point about this. You keep stuffing in energy, there's an inverse cascade, which is why this term is unimportant. So drag uh, determines the, um, the energy level. And then taking this URMS velocity, 
I can define a Rhine scale as the square root of u over beta, and there it is, and that's the predicted jet scale. Okay. But uh, the Rhine scale is not the only length scale. After all, we've got at least three parameters uh, here, epsilon, beta, and mu. And there's another one. Uh, I don't know if Ted talked about this. I regard this paper by Doug Lilly from 1969 as an un justly neglected paper because Lilly pointed out that uh, drag is uh, scale selective. You see, you might think that drag, if you looked at the equation, you've got d zeta dt equals minus mu zeta, and you can solve that as a differential equation. It's e to the minus mu t independent of the scale of anything. So that's a naive argument for saying that drag does not act differently on different eddy scales. That's completely wrong. So what Lilly realized is that drag is scale selective and it acts very heavily on the biggest, slowest eddies, that is the ones that are produced at the end of the inverse cascade, with or without beta, this is true. And what I'll call the Lilly length scale is the square root of epsilon over mu cubed. So just to flesh out Lilly's argument, and it, by the way, this argument applies to 2D turbulence with beta equals zero. So the idea is that if you have drag, there's an inverse energy cascade. It will not reach the domain scale, provided that the Lilly length, or Lilly's length, <laughs> maybe that's why this isn't popular terminology, provided that Lilly's length is much less than the domain scale. Okay, Lilly's length stops the inverse cascade. So we assume we have the, <coughs> the minus 5 third spectrum, it's uh, inverse energy cascade. We can talk about the characteristic velocity of eddies of size k, which, by which I mean I take an octave of wave numbers centered on the wave number I'm, equal, I'm interested in, and I simply integrate the k to the minus 5 third spectrum over that octave, and it says that the characteristic velocity of eddies with that wave number is epsilon to the 1 third uh, k to the minus one third. It has dimensions of velocity uh, as it should have. Then I can talk about the turnover time of uh, those eddies, and this has the dimensions of time. It's simply one over k is the length, and so this is how long it takes those eddies to turn over, epsilon to the minus one third, k to the minus two thirds. So as k goes to zero, the turnover time gets longer. Big eddies take a long time to turn over. And then I argue that bottom drag becomes important when the turnover time of the eddies is um, uh, multiplied by the drag constant is order one. That gives me a wave number, which is the inverse of the Lilly length scale there. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that beta can slow down the inverse cascade and funnel it into zonal mean flows, uh, but beta alone, I believe, cannot halt the inverse cascade. You require true drag in order to saturate things and come to a statistical steady state. And the in that sense, the Lilly wavelength is at least as important as the Rhine's length. And now there's a little bit of numerology here. We've got three dimensional constants, uh, the rate of energy supply, L squared over T cubed, uh, the beta effect, uh, one over LT, and the drag rate, and we can make a non-dimensional number, uh, which I'll call the zonostrophy number, and I'll use capital Z, which I don't think is standard notation, but I think it should be. So that's the zonostrophy number uh, made out of those three dimensional numbers. And we've got two lengths that I've talked about so far, uh, the Rhine's length, the Lilly length, which does not involve beta, and the third length, which was introduced by um, Thales and Maltrude. By the way, one comment about this, is, you know, it's kind of amazing, given the history of this problem. Um, I don't think that this non-dimensional parameter was recognized um, only in like 2007. Maybe there's an earlier paper by De Danilov and Grianik which mentions it, but it came very late in the discussion of anything. But it's clearly, the, you know, one of the essential control parameters is the zonostrophy number. And it can be thought of as a ratio of these different length scales. For instance, the Lilly length divided by the Rhine's length is the one quarter power of that non-dimensional number. 
the Rhine's number divided by the uh, Vallis and Maltrude length, L sub Vm, characterizes the intensity of the forcing relative to the PV gradient, uh, is given by the zonostrophy number to the power 1 over 20, and that's very unfortunate. Or you can say that Lily's length multiplied by the fifth power of the Vallis Maltrude number is the Rhine's length to the sixth power. Okay, all so of these links are connected. You have, you you have uh, more than one way to build a non-dimensional number. So here you could define the non-dimensional number by the ratio of one of these two scales. So it would be way simpler. Or you could do the same by looking at the ratio of time scale. Yeah. So, so because this power one over twenty, I mean, <laughs> because y you are taking astronomical number and computing the power one over twenty. It's a, um, bit, it's a bit well but I like round numbers so I don't have any fractions here back in my original definition uh, if I use this number if I use this definition for a non-dimensional number um, I can but then I'd have this ugly power 5 over 4 appearing in my definition yes but you, you <laughs> the number you compute at the end will be 1, 2, 3, 4 it will not be 10 to the 6 10 to the 8 10 to the 25 I like round numbers, which is <laughs> which is why I picked this one. <laughs> and um, of course, there are actually I think a, 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 an even more uncomfortable question. Of course, um, is there's at least a fourth length that I could add to the list, uh, which is the length scale of the forcing, and we haven't mentioned that. So I could take the ratio, um, and there's a fifth length, which is the domain scale, which I'm just assuming is completely irrelevant. Uh, but there's a second, at least a second non-dimensional parameter which is the length scale of the forcing divided by, take your pick, any one of these three. Sorry, what is the what? Zonostrophic means following the zone, following zonal contours, flowing in the zonal direction. Well, it's, <laughs> uh, it's the, uh, it's the non-dimensional number which uh, measures the strength of the forcing, right? You see, it's directly proportional to the energy injection rate, very strongly dependent on mu. And so the proponents of this particular non-dimensional parameter would say you could have two very different uh, simulations, numerical simulations, uh, with different values of epsilon, beta, and mu, and the same value of the zonostrophy number, and they would be essentially identical if this is the only non-dimensional parameter uh, which is relevant. That is, they'd have the same number of jets in those two seemingly different solutions. You'd have the same fraction of kinetic energy in the jets uh, in the, the two solutions. So if this is the only parameter that matters, it's very important because uh, we can scan the entire solution space by changing one parameter rather than three, epsilon, mu, and beta. Uh, yeah, it's exact. So any fl any function of y is an exact solution, right? With zero frequency, steady solution. The shapes are very distinctive with that east-west asymmetry. Yeah, I'll talk about that briefly at the end. Um, by the way, do I? When am I supposed to finish? Three minutes. Oh dear. No, okay. ac actually, uh, we should finish now. So, so, <laughs> so, but, but, okay. we, so, we, 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 we can have uh, five more minutes, or maybe just say that we will finish tomorrow. So it depends how long you you need actually to to finish. Okay, okay. If we've got time tomorrow, I just have, it'll be like a 10 minute talk because I have five slides. <laughs> Plus question, yeah. right? Plus, I guess. Yeah, okay. this is probably a good place to stop. Okay. Okay, thank you. So maybe there are questions already now? Um, 
quick question about the diffusivity ba based on the uh, potential rigidity. Yeah. Uh, so I, I uh, my understanding the argument is that if you um, if you do do the diffusivity for the PV, then uh, is is not going to be positive everywhere. Right. Uh, but I, I I guess I mean if 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 the PV gradient is defined along the PV contour, so just like uh, reorganize everything in uh, PV in the equivalent latitude, then that particular PV, uh, PV diffusivity is positive definite everywhere. Is, is that right? I don't know about that. Is it? Um because w we can think of like the uh, cross PV material line transport, then that's got to be positive. Uh um. Well, there's a there's a small scale uh, diffusivity in the model, which is, w which is, um, I think I called it nu, which is guaranteed to be down gradient. Yeah, there is a small explicit diffusivity in the model, which you could think of as a PV diffusivity, which is guaranteed to be down gradient. But the question is whether, when you have this eddying state with emergent eddies, uh, whether um, uh, whether that's um, whether some, there's something that you might call an eddy diffusivity, uh, w which it's useful to think of as a diffusivity in the sense that it's positive definite and it does other things we expect. So you're right. If you follow individual contours of PV, um, well, okay. And what do you mean by down the PV gradient? Are you including beta or not? Then, then okay. Then even this. And even this is not necessarily down gradient, because the PV gradient would be um, grad zeta plus beta y hat. So it's beta, you know, it's it's not clear. Um, qu question about um, where in the um, the st uh, the steady state uh, with the zonal jets. Um, do um, do the waves, uh, the Rosby waves, still play a role? And uh, if so, uh, where are they located in the dispersion relation? Yeah, so people, I think the Rosby waves are still active there. They're being generated in the eastward uh, regions and dissipating in the westward regions. Um, and I think you see that when you look at the zonally averaged entropy equation, that budget that I was talking about still has some utility in understanding. The eddy entropy budget still has some utility in understanding what's going on, and you uh, you see that there's a stronger um, stronger entropy dissipation in the westward flowing regions, where the uh, PV gradient is reduced by the flow. That is, beta minus U Y Y uh, is less than beta in these regions. And uh, on this uh, on this movie, can I see a uh, Rosby waves propagating? No, you probably can't, but I think they're still there. Um, you can certainly see them with a little bit of, um, you can see what are called satellite modes. I mentioned them briefly uh, the other day. Uh, the jets that form, I think, have a, like a, perhaps a wave number one or two uh, modulation in the X direction. They're meandering a little bit. Um, so that's a not quite zonal, but very long scale uh, variation, which is probably important and hasn't received the discussion it deserves. may be useful to check if there are Rosby waves or not because uh, so for instance doing a, a space frequency yeah. diagram to see whether there is some trace of a dispersion relation or so it's it's not it's not clear that we sh one should expect to to see Rosby wave but yeah yeah but but still i mean if, if some modes are preferred or not well, I think the I, th I think the that's why I mentioned the uh, the mode with very long x scale, uh, because it mo it moves so fast, it probably does satisfy the unshifted dispersion relation. But I think I agree that if you really want to, s you should really take uh, maybe the time average of this profile and linearize around it and try and see if there's anything there because it is going to change the dispersion relation. You can easily calculate it. If beta minus u bar yy is still positive, 
or, or if it's changed sign? No, th this, this flow has not reversed the sign of beta minus UYY. It's still positive. I mean, the, I think in this particular solution, I don't know, you've canceled maybe one, one quarter of beta at this point. It's not a very, um, it's not that strongly nonlinear. Okay, so maybe uh, we will continue with the talk and uh, more questions uh, tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Let's go into...